BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays this year, I've been doing a regular segment about the Phantom Killer an unidentified serial killer who committed a crime spree in Texarkana back in 1946. And the crimes attributed to this individual have been labeled as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. And just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we truly begin. The first is that this is the concluding segment for the Phantom Killer series. And next week on the channel, in its place... I will be doing a new series on Jack the Ripper, and the first episode in that series will cover the suspect Charles Lechmere, also known as Charles Cross. Now, you close followers of Black Box Online Radio will notice that I already did part one of the Charles Lechmere series, which came out last Friday for the Anything Goes segment, and the second part will be coming out next Wednesday to anyone who's listening to these things live or regularly. But if you're listening to this in the future, there are going to be several episodes that are covering that specific Jack the Ripper suspect because absolutely too much material for a single episode on Charles Lechmere. And there are also countless ways to explore the Ripper case, and that will be the subject of the Wednesday show for the foreseeable future. And I feel a little bit conflicted about that. Firstly, I just got pulled into the Ripper world, and there are lots of things that I want to share with you guys, but on the other hand, there are, there's a lot of unfinished business with the Phantom Killer segment, because I had wanted to go through the writings of Michael Newton about the Phantom Killer, as well as looking at some alternative theories and suspects, but unless there is some type of major breakthrough in the case... There could be a new Phantom Killer series in the distant future here on Black Box Online Radio. And of course, the other reminders would be that there is a regular segment coming out on the weekends about the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey from 1996. And I started that one as a book discussion on Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular, but I'm a little bit disappointed with that book, and I'm going to be looking at some other sources, and I even did one on the documentary Suburban Nightmare Jean Benet Ramsey. So it's morphed into its own regular segment here on the weekends. And of course, there is always Zodiac Monday. Every Monday is Zodiac Monday, where I talk about the Zodiac Killer. And now is a good time to mention buymeacoffee.com. If you go over to buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88, you can make a donation or contribution to support this show and all of these efforts. And anyone who makes a shout-out, anyone who makes a contribution or donation on buymeacoffee.com will get a shout-out on Zodiac Mondays. Yeah, I did that a little bit out of order, but um, thank you to all the previous supporters in the past. Now, to continue with this Phantom Killer discussion, I encountered an article from the New York Daily News that I wanted to respond to, and in the past I said that I did not like to read someone else's articles in their entirety, but I find that it's actually somewhat valuable because you can get the full picture. And this is called Murder Spree in Texas at the Hands of Phantom Killer by Mara Bovson in the New York Daily News. And if anyone would like to uh, read this, you can find it online for free, but also you can get the text-to-voice version, and it reminds me of so many um, experiences that I had in my younger years 
I had a lot of problems reading in school. Like just, it's not even so much reading; it's the concentration aspect of it. And um, so I think about that every time I use the text to voice features, and it shocks me now because almost every ounce of free time I have is devoted to either reading true crime material, reading true crime books, like The Phantom Killer by James Presley, and talking about true crime. It's uh, kind of odd how life changes, but I'd like to go to uh, Mara Bosen's article. Seventy years ago, the small town of Texarkana became the stuff of horror movies. It began on February 22nd of 1946 when Jimmy Hollis, age 25, and Mary Jean LeRae, age 19, went to a movie. The evening ended with the young couple in a lover's lane near the town, which straddles the border between Texas and Arkansas. And of course, Texarkana is a border town. There is a Texas side, Texarkana, Texas, and then there's the Arkansas side, Texarkana, Arkansas. All of a sudden, a bright flashlight beam blinded Hollis, and a male voice ordered him to take off his pants. Then the stranger stomped and clobbered the young man so savagely that his skull cracked, putting him into a coma for days. And there's a little bit more information than that when I was reading James Presley's book. It's that Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae are in the car, and they're driving, but Jimmy Hollis just chose to pull over and he wanted to go out and look at the stars, and it was a spur-of-the-moment decision, so about um, that they went to a secluded lover's lane area. Kind of similar, but I think that it's um, a little bit less planned than this article makes it out to be. Lorraine tried to run away, but the stranger quickly caught up with her, beat her, and sexually assaulted her. Both Lorraine and Hollis survived to tell the story to the police. Unfortunately, there were discrepancies in their descriptions. The Ray insisted that the man was black, but also said that his head was covered by a white sack with holes cut out for the eyes and the mouth. Hollis couldn't remember much, but told the police he thought it was a young white man. And this becomes the source of the mystery. I mean, who was this person that attacked them? And this is the only true sighting of the Phantom Killer wearing that mask. And I think that that's a big reason why this story has been shared in its own variety. It's because of that masked figure that attacked Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae. I mean, who even knows if the killer was wearing a mask in the other murders, and the murders period, because firstly, Hollis and LeRae both survived this attack, but I think that it just adds another element of mystery, like perhaps if we had composites, guest drawings of multiple people, I think that would answer certain questions. About a month later, there was an, an attack on a couple in a lover's lane. Richard Griffin, age 29, and Polly Ann Moore, age 17. Their bodies were found next morning, both with fatal bullet wounds in the back of their heads. And some other info about that one that I covered in the series is that Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore were both placed inside the vehicle. It's most likely that they were murdered outside of the car. And then the killer pulled their bodies into the car and then pulled Richard Griffin's uh, pockets inside out. So maybe it was a robbery. Maybe it was not. It was just staged to look like a robbery. But this is the first time that we actually get some forensic material and something to explore. Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore were shot with, a, with an automatic thirty two caliber firearm. And that will be important. April brought, brought a third attack, this one on high school sweethearts Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker. Paul Martin was 16 and Betty Jo Booker was 15. Martin had picked up Booker after a dance where she had been playing the saxophone in a band. Martin's body was spotted the next morning. He had four bullet wounds. A search party later found Betty Jo Booker, who had been shot in the head and the heart. Now, it does say here that they were high school sweethearts, but in other sources... Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore are described as just friends, so the fact that they're leaving this event late at night together, of course people are going to start thinking something's going on, but you gotta see that they were just teenagers, and Betty Jo Booker was even somewhat of a young teenager, and sometimes teenage relationships aren't exactly as romantic as people think they are, and it might have actually been very mild, and I think that there could have been some type of romantic insinuation going on, but also they might not have even been very physical. They, It's quite possible that they went to the lover's lane just to talk, and I'm citing some other sources that are drawing upon other sources from that that I covered in the earlier parts of the series. 
It would be decades before criminologists would coin the term serial killer, but by this time, the Texarkana police were certain that the attacks were the handiwork of the same person. The FBI and the Texas Rangers, including the legendary Captain Manuel Gonzalez, also known as Lone Wolf Gonzalez, came in on the case. Hundreds of tips poured in and police interviewed scores of Texarkana lowlifes. But none of it stopped the violence. On May 3rd, Virgil Starks, age 37, was reading a newspaper in, in his living room when two bullets crashed through the window and hit him in the head and killed him instantly. When Starks' wife Katie rushed to help, she got two bullets in the face. Miraculously, her injuries did not kill her, and she was wearing only a bloody nightgown, but she fled across a highway to get to the safety of her neighbor's home. And, um... Some other things about that is that the neighbors were actually um, a relative of hers, so that she, it was just a point of safety that she would have thought about. By the time the police arrived, the killer had vanished. And there's a reason for that, because um, the male resident of the home that Katie was running to fired a gunshot into the sky to scare off the perpetrator. Swarms of reporters who conjured up the terrifying nickname the Phantom Killer descended on the town. The Texarkana Gazette printed, a front page color photo of a red handled flashlight that the phantom killer had dropped at the Starks house in hopes that someone would recognize it, but no one did. And before I say anything else about suspects or theorizing, I would like to talk about the murder of Virgil Starks. And he was much older than the other victims. You heard that Betty Jo Booker was 15, Virgil Starks was 37. He was not sitting in a car, the way that the other victims were, or at the very least, nearby a car. Jimmy Hollis got out of a car, as I said, to look at the stars. But you have an, el an older couple, not elderly, I almost said elderly, no, absolutely not. Virgil and Katie Starks were both in their late 30s. Virgil was 37. Katie was born just a few months apart from him, actually. And they are just in their house, minding their own business. Virgil is actually listening to a radio show, and he has a newspaper with him. And I have re used James Presley's book, The Phantom Killer, for a lot of these sources in this book discussion, or in this discussion, which actually kind of morphed into its own book discussion on James Presley's work. And some info that he shared about the murder of Virgil Starks is the police were very certain that... This was almost either a semi-automatic or automatic firearm that was used based on the pattern of the bullets and the frequency in which they were fired. Because somebody is shooting into the Starks house and they're using a twenty two caliber firearm. Now was it a twenty two caliber pistol or rifle? They couldn't rule out that it was a pistol, but based on the accuracy, it seemed like that it was a twenty two caliber rifle. Katie Starks did not get a look at the gun, and she also didn't get a look at the perpetrator. No definitive sighting of the phantom killer in the White Hood. And at this time, I should also mention the prime suspect in the case, Yule Swinney. I did an episode about him, and he is mentioned in James Presley's book, The Phantom Killer, as being the suspect whom all five of these uh, murders and all of the phantom killer's attacks should be attributed to. However... I was trying to find a very specific source that I had heard for the last Phantom Killer discussion that I did, and that was that certain pieces of Virgil Starks's mechanical shop items were found in Yule Swinney's possession, and I don't even want to misstate it, but I'm just going to put it out there because I couldn't find the exact source that I encountered. I think it said that bolts from Virgil Starks's welding shop were found in the possession of Yule Swinney. In addition to having the farm where uh, Virgil Starks was murdered, he had a welding shop. So, yes, of course, he had um, items that were used in various uh, mechanical and machine capacities. I don't know exactly how true that is, but some of the reasons why people suspect Yule Swinney is that after he had been arrested, he said that he was going to get the chair, and then they said, well... We're arresting you for stealing cars. You don't get the chair for stealing cars. And then he said, oh, you've got a lot more on me than just stealing cars. And if it is true that there was some type of item from Virgil Starks's welding shop that ended up in Yule Swinney's possession, that suggests that there was some type of definitive connection. And with the 
phantom killer targeting Virgil Starks, and that crime being so different. I mean, not a lover's lane, not two people in a car, not a man and a woman outside, but rather two people are inside, not to mention the age of the victim being much older, and all of those differences. I began to think that, I mean, could Yul Swinney be the prime suspect for the murder of Virgil Starks? I could comprehend that narrative. I mean, of course, somebody like James Presley, author of The Phantom Killer, Unlocking the Mystery of Texarkana's Serial Murders, I would uh, disagree with that. And other people like the psychologist Anthony LaPala would disagree with that as well, who said this is all one person. But I would expect that they perhaps truly know whether or not Yul Swinney was the phantom killer or not. By they, I mean the authorities. As stated very clearly, Mary Jean LeRae was sexually assaulted, so there was DNA left behind. And also, there is a report that states that there was a palm print of a suspect left behind, not to mention the flashlight that was dropped at the Starks' house. So I would think that the authorities would have a pretty clear idea as to whether or not... Um, who committed which crimes, or were there multiple killers. And if you even get on the Wikipedia page, it states that by 1948, the authorities believed that there was no longer a phantom killer connection to the murder of Virgil Starks. But does that rule out Yule Swinney? I mean, if he had been arrested as many times as he was, and um, he was, as I said, also arrested for car theft and booked, sent to jail. He did like 26 years for habitual car theft, which was a very long amount of time. And some people just think that, well, he was the phantom killer, but they didn't want to prosecute him, go through that lengthy trial when they could just send him to jail for 26 years. Then there, that's just the end of it. That's the end of it. That he went to jail for something else, and that's why he wasn't prosecuted. But I don't accept that. No, absolutely not. Instead, I would think that they probably have his palm print on file, his fingerprints, absolutely, if he had been arrested so many times. So I think that um, all of that is pointing against Yul Swinney being the sole perpetrator. And another aspect of this Phantom Killer discussion that I've been doing with you guys is I'm very disappointed that I don't find anything that proves my original hypothesis wrong. When I started this series, I wanted to explore the hypothesis that there was, there were a set of unconnected crimes that were created and united by the media, that the media, as well as perhaps some of the incorrect deductions of the police force, led people to think that this was all one killer, when in reality, it's actually a state of mass hysteria, more or less. And maybe hysteria isn't the word, the best word. More like creating inappropriate connections between certain crimes and among all of these crimes. Such as the fact that the first time this person's wearing a hooded mask and sexually assaulting the female victim. The second time the victims are murdered outside the car. I mean, the fact that alone that they are murdered. That was not a beating. That was not a sexual assault. And that they're then dragged into the car and the pockets are turned inside out. Very, very different crimes. Unless the um, police have some type of forensic evidence that has not been made extremely clear. I don't, I'm not seeing a strong connection between those two. That's the Hollis and LeRae attack and the Griffin Moore attacks. And then you have the attack on Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin, which more or less those two victims are hunted for sport, and a very substantial distance is found between Paul Martin's body and Betty Jo Booker's body. Then you have the Starks murder, which takes place inside the house, and the um, victims are older, all of the differences that I've already stated. But a true unifying factor between the second and third crimes is that a thirty two caliber automatic pistol was used, and I can accept that that was the same perpetrator. However, this is the biggest however. Think of this with a capital H. I've talked to you guys a lot about Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer and the New Orleans Axeman. And I, over time, I can comprehend more about how all the differences in these crime sprees 
can show that it was a single perpetrator. I mean, you look at the Zodiac Killer mystery, there are an enormous amount of differences, yet a single perpetrator theory is very plausible. You look at the Jack the Ripper case, and it's a little bit harder, but it's still possible. You look at the Phantom Killer case, and it is still completely possible, plausible, and reasonable to think that this was all one person. And one thing that people don't like too much about Black Box Online Radio is that I jump around from idea to idea, and they're saying, no, wait a second, wait a second, you just contradicted yourself, you just said all of these points about how there are multiple killers, and now you're saying all these points about how there was a single killer? Well, it's an unsolved case. I don't know, and I'm also not selling you anything about the Phantom Killer. So, I'm just telling you what I genuinely think. There are points for and points against about how these operations took place. There could have been a deranged maniac who was fueled by sexual impulses to commit violence, and he committed five murders in Texarkana in 1946, or there could have been a set of crimes that took place in a very small amount of time, and the media made people think that this was all one person, that this was a phantom killer. My honest take on the attack on Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae is that that was a very deranged sexual assault and that somebody was just absolutely out of his mind, but he um, wanted to sexually assault the female, humiliate the male. Maybe, maybe some type of robbery was planned, but that was just like a pure maniacal, purely maniacal crime that took place. With the um, Griffin Moore murders, it's possible that there was a real robbery that took place about how the victim's bodies were staged and um, the pockets pulled inside out. Some things could have actually been stolen, maybe. And then with the uh, Booker Martin murders, again, that's just someone who is most likely trying to kill the victims, not get caught, lost control of a situation, then regain control of the situation. And with the Starks murder, it seemed like Virgil Starks was t specifically targeted, the fact that he's inside his home and he is shot sitting in his chair listening to the radio. But the fact is, um, when the person heard the gunshot that was fired into the sky by the neighbor of Katie Starks, he most likely ran away, so... Definitely not a completely deranged maniac, someone who was going through an episode where they weren't aware of their mental faculties. I mean, at the very least, they had instincts and calculation, but with such little evidence, if I had to make a determination right now, I would say that there actually were different killers in this. If I had to, we're talking something like... 51% multiple killers, 49% a single killer, but I would lean toward that being the mass hysteria, fictitious connection angle, that Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae were attacked by a different person. One person committed the Griffin Moore and Booker Martin murders. Why? Um, I simply, I simply do not know. And that somebody else committed the Starks murder, and perhaps that even could be Yule Swinney, and why did the crime stop? Why did the crime stop? Well, there wasn't an actual phantom killer to begin with. There was just a cluster of criminal activity and not a lot of evidence left behind, and that people insisted that it had to have been the same person, and maybe you got some things like similar footprints, because also in James Presley's book, it's shared that they were able to identify the walking path of the killer out of, um, out of the uh, Starks' home and walking up to the Starks' home, but not a lot of info was shared. They just said that these are the boots of a of a man, which we already knew to begin with, that um, or that the uh, whatever theory that you're going with, the perpetrator in the Phantom Killer case was most likely male. So, I mean, Virgil Starks, like if he actually did have some type of definitive connection to Yule Swinney, then. Yul Swinney should be a pretty good suspect for that. That would explain all of his odd behavior. And another reason, though, why Yul Swinney becomes the prime suspect is his wife, Peggy Swinney, provided all types of statements that um, made him look very guilty. And she even said that she was a witness to one of the crimes. 
But the police didn't believe her. I also don't believe her. I think that she had some buyer's remorse for her marriage. She was very mad against it, mad at him. So she wanted to do something to vilify Yule Swinney, because why is it in why why isn't that why aren't those purely established facts that she's saying stuff like oh well she was close by on one of the murders and she witnessed Yule Swinney attack Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin and throw Betty Jo Booker's saxophone over a fence on the right side of the road. Well, why aren't these established facts? Why doesn't the forensic evidence support that a hundred percent? Or why couldn't she provide details? that only the killer would know, not something that the police would have already been able to know that could have been fed to her by interrogations, as well as her attorney. I mean, it's not enough. It's insufficient. And the police didn't believe her. I don't believe her. And that's why it's an unsolved case. But I have to also be very clear that I've talked to you guys about several different serial killer mysteries. I listed some of them. The Long Island serial killer was another one. And I also don't want to be in the position where I'm just chalking everything up to multiple killers. And I definitely could put that all in order and be like, oh yeah, that's that's why these things like ha like Jack the Ripper happen, or the New Orleans Axeman, or the Phantom Killer, or the Zodiac Killer. Well, they're just unconnected crimes that have been created and strung together by someone's imagination at some point along the way. Jack the Ripper, for example, a journalist named Frederick Best, could have fabricated letters. The New Orleans Axeman actually could have just been that um, there were copycat crimes, as well as a jazz musician writing a letter t pretending to be the Axeman, saying, if you don't jazz it up, you'll get the axe or also genuinely unconnected crimes where someone, like, um, attacked a woman and beat her with a lamp and then stole the axe, that would also fall in the copycat category because, I mean, that was talking about the attack on Harriet Schneider where someone m most likely committed a crime, got caught, and then they tried to pass it off as the axe man, and they did it rather successfully. But, um, with the Phantom Killer, I mean... I'm really not seeing something that is overwhelmingly convincing that this was actually one person. But I, the reason I mentioned the Long Island serial killer was that is an example of a true crime case where I go with one perpetrator. Yes, the Long Island serial killer committed a rather conventional serial killer uh, reign of terror from 1996 to 2010. Maybe more, maybe less, but yes one serial killer, one perpetrator, and um, that one, I don't see the evidence of multiple killers, and I'm really hoping that anybody, including me, isn't going to look at a serial killer mystery and just play the game of, I'm going to force my personality onto these events, and this is what makes sense to me. Well, it doesn't have to make sense to anybody, because it was John Lorden who hosts um, the show Brain Scratch, and his true crime uh, channel here on YouTube, he said that sometimes in the true crime world, we will get answers that won't make sense to us. And that is just so true. It's like, you won't comprehend the motive, or you don't comprehend why this person did something, or you won't comprehend why this is a better interpretation of the evidence than this. But the fact of the matter is, that's what actually happened. That's the answer to the mystery, and I totally um, side with that point. But I think I've shared all of my observations about the Phantom Killer case, and in the future I would love to do some more book discussions on this. I said I wanted to read Michael Newton's book, and I also am very fascinated with the comparing and contrasting between the Phantom Killer case and the Zodiac case. The Phantom Killer is more or less a predecessor of the Zodiac Killer, I genuinely believe that the Zodiac was very familiar with the Phantom Killer story from 1946 and used it as a model for the crimes that took place in the 1960s. I also believe that the Zodiac was very familiar with Jack the Ripper. And I've contemplated writing a book about the evolution of these serial killers with, with um, those four case examples that I've been talking about. Jack the Ripper, the New Orleans Axeman, the Phantom, and the Zodiac Killer. Because... 
I think that Jack the Ripper was a real turning point for criminal behavior, and mass hysteria could be one thing, fictitious connections could be one thing, incorrect interpretations of the evidence could be another, but I would love to talk to you guys more about this in the future, but as of now, I will turn it over to you and look forward to reading your comments down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.